Now we're going to talk about types of pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. All right. Well, so first you could be, you could have healthy pelvic floor muscles. And if you're here and you have healthy pelvic floor muscles and none of those symptoms, that is fantastic. And there's going to be plenty of things for you to do in this challenge. The exercises every day are great. Uh, and learning about all of this information will be helpful to prevent pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. But um, most pelvic floor muscle uh, dysfunction will fall under these categories. Categories, okay, so we have overactive pelvic floor muscles. That's basically, if you remember, in that contraction and the relaxation where the muscles are not relaxed. We have underactive, we have a mixture, and then we also have uncoordinated uh, pelvic floor muscles. So I like to use an analogy of your arm, okay? So let's talk about, first off, overactive pelvic floor muscles. So you have a bicep muscle here, right? Attaches here to here. The bicep bends your arm, and it also uh, eccentrically uh, contracts to let the arm straighten out, all right? So um, a bicep that is very, very tight and that is active all day long, every day, like think about this bicep that was in this position. Is this going to be a healthy bicep? No, like if you go to try to lengthen it, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be painful. It's going to feel cramped. It's going to feel tight. And so the same thing applies to the pelvic floor muscles. So if you're constantly tightening, tightening, holding tension there. Those pelvic floor muscles, uh, there's different terms for it, but what we're using is the term overactive pelvic floor muscles. And so these are muscles that are tense and usually they are not strong. So it's, it is really a myth that tight muscles are strong muscles. Because would this bicep muscle be strong if you were holding it like this all day, every day, and then you wanted to go lift a big stack of wood or something, something heavy? Would you be able to lengthen it? Would you be able to activate it? Would it be strong? No, it wouldn't. So a tight, uh, overactive muscle is not a strong muscle. And it can impact your body and your pelvic floor muscles in different ways. So we're going to go over that in the next slide. But I want you to understand the concept there of overactive pelvic floor muscles. Now, underactive pelvic floor muscles are muscles that are kind of stretched out. They're kind of uh, weak. These are definitely weak. These are overstretched. Uh, think about this hammock. And so we have this hammock of muscles and these underactive pelvic floor muscles might be very overstretched. They're weak. They're difficult to engage. Uh, let's also think about like that bladder outlet when they try to squeeze to close that bladder outlet. They just don't have the power to do that. So that's underactive. We have a mixture. So if you remember, we have the pelvic floor muscles and you have multiple muscles and multiple layers that make up the pelvic floor. And just because you have dysfunction in one set of muscles doesn't mean you're automatically going to have dysfunction in the other set or the same type of dysfunction. So an example I like to use is let's say somebody is leaking urine. Okay. So this is the urethra outlet there. That's where urine exits. And uh, let's say they're not having any other symptoms, no pain with sex, they're not having any problems with pooping, they're pooping every day, no pain, and they're doing exercises, they're squeezing, 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 but they're only working the back part of the pelvic floor muscles. So great, they're working their anus, they're working their anus, they're working these back muscles, but they're not working the muscles that are around the urethra, okay? So they could have underactive and weak pelvic floor muscles at the front in those in that area, and they could have healthy pelvic floor muscles back here. So that's a mixture. That would be a mixture. And that's just one example of what could occur. So like people will come in and say, oh, I've done kegels and kegels don't work for me. Well, what were you doing? So, so number one, what muscles were you actually working? And then number two, how were you working them? Were you training them the way that we want you to train them uh, and the way they need to be trained? Were you teaching them? Uh, and so we're going to go through this in the challenge, but that's one example of people that, you know, I've heard that 
probably hundreds of times, like Kegels don't work for me. Well, let's back up and start at the beginning. All right, and then our last category is uncoordinated. So remember, we have those four categories, the pelvic floor muscles, healthy pelvic floor muscles should do the right thing at the right time. They should correctly contract, completely let go, be active at the right times and be relaxed at the right time. So let's say that the pelvic floor muscles are active when you're trying to pee or when you're trying to poop, you're squeezing, squeezing, squeezing. Well, is it going to be, <laughs> is it going to be easy to pee or poop? No, it's going to be difficult. You're going to have to strain. Uh, you're going to have to push. It might be painful. You might have incomplete emptying. So that's one example of uncoordinated pelvic floor muscles. Another example might be you have a good contraction here around the anus. So let's say you have a good squeeze, but when you go to cough or sneeze, you're always farting. Okay, well, that's showing that those muscles around the anus aren't coordinating with that increase in your intra-abdominal pressure. All right, so I hope that was helpful to give you an overview of the types of pelvic floor muscle dysfunction and how they can impact different areas of your pelvic health.